Let's pray. Father, would you open the eyes of our hearts to this vital gospel message? Lord, let them see you in me. Let them hear you when I speak, so that all glory and honor is yours. Amen. My oldest son, Billy, is currently an EMT, and he's studying to be a paramedic. And his schooling has heightened my family's interest in all of the EMS shows, the, med the uh, emergency medical shows. I don't know if we have any fans of these shows, but there's uh, Boston EMS or Life in the ER or Trauma in the ER. And our favorite show happens to be Night Watch. And Night Watch follows EMS crews as they work the night shift, the 8 uh, p.m. shift to the 4 a.m. shift in New Orleans, or as they say, New Orleans. And you can imagine the kind of things that they encounter. It's unpredictable, it can be intense. At times it's, I, I hate to say it, at times it can be funny. But my heart gets pounding because you follow these crews, the call comes into the state, into the, um, to the dispatcher, and the dispatcher then calls either the uh, paramedic or calls the police. And you're, you as the viewer, is, you're actually riding along in the ambulance with them, and you get to hear everything that's going on. And my heart starts pounding because you never know what they're gonna come upon. You don't know what they're actually responding to. They know there might be a car accident, but what will they find when they get there? And so these shows really get my heart pumping, and I have to mentally prepare what, what, prepare, um, what I'm gonna see through their eyes. And if I can stomach watching, I pay attention to what they're gonna do in the event I ever come upon an emergency. If I'm the one who happens to be at the scene of the accident, I need to know what to do. So I really like watching these shows. And in my son's stories, and I watch the shows, I've kind of surmised my own theory that there's three types of patients that you find. And I call them the three C's. The first patient, sometimes they come across, I call clueless. They have absolutely no idea what's going on. They have no idea why the ambulance is there. We were watching one show, and I'll never forget, the guy had blood on him, and they get him in the ambulance. They're like, hey, hey buddy, where do you hurt? Well, I don't know. Well, do you remember what happened? Well, I don't know. So they begin examining him, and as they're doing that, the paramedic puts the hand on the back of his head, and she's like, do you know you have a bullet wound back here, like a bullet hole? And he's like, what? So then they're looking for the, where the bullet would come out, and they couldn't find it. So all this to say, he had been shot in the head and didn't even know it. So some patients are clueless. Another type of patient is the combative patient. My son has told us stories about this, that uh, one guy said, you know, you put that on my arm, I'm gonna punch you. My, my son said, well, I had to, he had to restrain him. But there's the combative one, the one who knows they need help, the one who knows they're injured, but they're just not willing to receive help. And then there's the third one I'll call cooperative and calm. They're aware of their circumstances, they know that they've been hurt, and they're so grateful for the help. Oh, thank you for saving my life. You know how they would say it in the South. So we have the clueless, the combative, and the cooperative calm one. In addition to patient types, I also learned to watch for vital signs. If you come up on the scene of an accident or whatever the nature of the accident is, you have to check for vital signs. You know, your um, breathing, pulse, skin, blood pressure. And it got me to thinking, what about our spiritual health? Are there ways to see if our faith is alive and well? Just as there's clear indicators of our physical health, there's clear indicators of our spiritual health. And in Mark chapter eight, we'll look at three vital signs to help us diagnose if there is life in our walk with Jesus, or is your relationship with him on life support? If you could only hear one message in the gospel of Mark, this is it, because it's the Lord's teaching with regard to inviting sinners to come to him for peace, for forgiveness, and for eternal life. And friends, whether we like it or not, we are the sinners. That's why we just went through Easter. That's what Easter was all about. So if you can just listen to this gospel message, this is not an invitation to health or wealth or a trouble-free living. Instead, Jesus spells out the cost of discipleship. But before we get to our scripture verses, Jesus is walking around town, and he's with his disciples, and there's a crowd following him. 
And he's trying to, Jesus is trying to get a pulse on who the disciples think that he is. So Jesus asks, who are people, what are people saying about me? Who do they say that I am? And some of the disciples say, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Jesus turns to them and say, who do you say that I am? Put yourself in their position. If Jesus turned to you today and said, who do you say that I am? Would you declare him as the Messiah? And there goes our beloved Peter, always the first one to jump out of the boat, walk across water, pull his sword, do whatever. He says, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. Actually, in Matthew's gospel, it says, um, Peter responds, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. However Peter articulated it that day, he gets it right. He got it right. And he understands that he is, Jesus is the promised Messiah. The disciples have come to understand that Jesus is God in human flesh. And this is where the gospel begins. This is euphoria. But then Jesus turns his disciples' attention from his identity to that of his forthcoming activity. So they're at this great high. Yay, you're the Messiah. And then Jesus suddenly says, but. He would suffer, be rejected, and killed. And on the third day, he would die. And on the third day, he would rise again. And somewhere in that, the disciples, I don't think, in my oppression, they don't hear what Jesus says that he's going to rise again. Somehow they miss that because all of a sudden they go to the idea that a suffering Messiah wasn't part of their plan. See, Jesus is here explaining uh, God's plan for redemption to his followers. But instead, the disciples are thinking, suffering, man, that's not Savior of the world stuff. That stuff doesn't jive with who we thought the Messiah was going to be and do. So it's just not registering with them. See, the Jewish Messiah, the Messiah they were thinking was going to bring deliverance through conquest. Jesus says, no, I'm here to bring deliverance through a cross. Friends, how often do we find ourselves in that position where we expected God to do one thing, but it turns out another? We feel disappointed, we feel angry, because God isn't meeting our expectations. I'm sure you know what I mean. I can fill in the blanks for myself. Over the years, I've said so many times, God, I thought. God, I thought. God, I thought it wouldn't take me five years to have my first child. God, I thought you wouldn't take my mother on Christmas morning. God, I thought my husband wouldn't lose his job when he was two or three years out of retirement. But God had a different plan, and I had to trust his plan was better. You fill in the blanks. What's your God, I thought? We all have them. And that's why it's so important that we look at the gospel and what Mark's about to tell us, because this is the gospel at its very core. Scripture, our scripture this morning is Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 36. If you want to pull out your pew Bibles, it's on page 1000. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and the gospel will save it. What good is it for man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Think about this. The, the disciples went from, yeah, you are the Messiah, to all of a sudden to self-denial, cross-bearing, and following Jesus. It's not an easy message to hear. Talk about a killjoy to go from here all of a sudden to here. Did you ever run across places like that in the Bible where you just had to hit the pause button? You think, man, what is that about? And I began to ask myself, how deeply has the gospel really gripped me? In light of what we just went through last week, Easter, think about it. Has the gospel meant anything to you? Was coming here just an act of religious obligation, or did Easter really mean something to you? I began to ask myself, what does the gospel call, cost, cost me? See, Jesus widens, as we read our scripture, Jesus widens the circle of invitation. 
He brings everyone into the conversation. This time it's not just the disciples, because he says he drew the crowd in. And friends, we are the crowd this morning. He draws the crowd in and says, if anyone, anyone is me and anyone is you. If anyone wants to, to be my disciple, this is what has to happen. Deny oneself, take up a cross, and then Jesus says, follow me. Not an easy message to hear, but it's gospel, it's scripture, and we need to hear it. I had to stop and ask myself, where do I stand in this so I had to take a spiritual inventory of my life. I asked, how are my vital signs checking out in three, these three areas? And as I go through them, I invite you to check your vital signs in these areas. Vital sign number one, self-denial. This isn't the kind of self-denial where you're totally oblivious. You're like, oh, I'm, not, I'm denying that. It's not that kind of self-denial. Jesus says, you want to come to me? Do you, Kathy? then this is the type of self-denial I'm talking about. When Jesus speaks of self-denial, he's not talking about giving up a few comforts. I know some of us fast, and fasting is good. I'm not saying that. But that's just like a temporary discomfort. Jesus is going much, much deeper here. Jesus is telling us that we can no longer be the center of our lives. Denying oneself means dying to everything that we are, and everything that we have in this life. We die to our agendas, our plans, our ambitions, our calendars. And friends, I know this strikes at the very heart of who we are, the very heart of our existence. Because the one thing, especially we Americans covet, and we Americans hang on to and value, is the right to make decisions for ourselves. But scripture says, do you remember what Paul says? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. If we're going to follow Jesus, we no longer own ourselves. What does that mean? It means we're no longer in the driver's seat. We put Jesus in the driver's seat. It doesn't mean that we're going to be deprived of joy and happiness. I can tell you that the most joy I've ever had in my life and the happiness that I get is from Christ and in Christ alone. And I want for all of you to experience that. But we can only do that when we come to Christ. It means that our hope is found in Christ. It means that we trust that Christ has a better way. It means that we place our hands, it means we place our hands in the hands of God at all times, no matter where his hands lead us. So you want to come to Christ, do you? Check your pulse on self-denial. Vital sign number two, cross-bearing. Ooh, that's a tough one. What does cross-bearing mean? Bearing a cross is a choice. I know a, a long time, forgive me, Mom. When I was growing up, my mother would say to me when I was going through a hard time, pick up your cross and bear it. But that's not what it really means. It's not when we, um, we're going through a hard time and then we say, well, this is my cross. No, bearing a cross is a choice that we make. It's not something we didn't choose and just because it's hard, we say, this is our cross to bear. Bearing our cross means something deliberate. It's a voluntary form of sacrificial obedience that identifies us completely with Christ. Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. And being the Son of God and the Savior of the world means a cross. There is no crown without a cross. The cross here is kind of a metaphor, actually, for suffering. Um, not every believe, it's not saying every believer who comes to Christ is going to be crucified in the manner that he was, but we will suffer along the way. And some of you have already faced this. Because we stand for Christ, because we stand for the gospel, we're rejected by our friends. Sometimes our own family doesn't understand us. Those of you with children, or those of you, who, those of you with children, when we, we bring up our children in a Christian home, they don't get why they can't listen to that music that everybody else does. Those of you who are young, maybe in college, your decisions are going to be different than maybe those of your peers. Maybe you're not going to go out to that all-night banger. Maybe you're going to stay home, or maybe you're going to choose a movie instead. Christ bearing his cross leads us bearing our cross through suffering. But the good news, it's out to the other side to eternal glory. It's not about what we get in this world. It's about what we get in the next world. 
So you want to come to Christ? Check your heartbeat on cross-bearing. Our third vital sign, follow me. Well, what does that mean? We've heard this before, follow me. Following Jesus means our lives are marked by obedience and submission. It's not an either or, it's a both. We obey the word of God and we do it with love and joy and gratitude. It's possible to obey without submitting. Obedience is an outward action. Submitting is an inward attitude. It reminds me of the little boy who was having a bad day, being really bad, just wouldn't listen to his mother. And his mother says, Billy, get in the corner and sit down and take a time out. Billy trucks over to his little time out chair and sits down, and his arms folded and swinging his legs and, and he's mad. About five minutes later, he turns to his mother and he says, I'm sitting down on the outside, but on the inside, I'm standing up. So there's a difference. You see the difference? There, there's a difference in obeying and in submitting. God calls us not just to obey, but to submit. As followers of Christ, we're to replicate his love, his compassion, his mercy, his obedience, and his submission. If Christianity is dull and boring for you, I hear people, I've said that when I was growing up. It's boring. Do you want to know why it was boring? Because I was following a set of rules rather than a relationship. I was following a system and not a savior. Religion says change and then you can join us. Jesus says join and you will be changed. So you want to come to Christ, do you? How's your blood pressure with obedience and submission? And then Jesus continues in verse 35, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and the sake of the gospel will save it. This is one of the, I started asking myself, is this like the, the, the first shall be last and the last shall be first? And so I really had to think about this. Do you remember the show, The Biggest Loser? You won by losing the most weight, it's win by losing. It's kind of the same principle here. If you save your life in this life, if you cling to it, you hoard it, you hang on to your sin, Jesus says you will lose it eternally. But if you lose your life in this life, you give it up, you yield it to Christ, then Jesus said, you will save it and have life everlasting. As we close with our last verse, verse 36, he asks a question. What does, it, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Remember now, we're the crowd, and Jesus is asking us this same question. The crowd is you, and the crowd is me. And this world says that man is the most happiest when he has the most stuff. And folks, stuff doesn't always mean money. Right away, our mind goes to money. It's not. Stuff can be anything. It can be power. It can be our job status. It can be our looks in this world. All the, the, all the shows are getting nipped and tucked and this and that. It can be anything. So it's not just money. It's possessions. It's everything. The world says we're happiest when we have all that, right? But Jesus is asking, what if in getting all of our stuff, we forfeit our souls? You want to look at this another way? Your soul is worth more than anything in this world. There's no price for your, your soul except for the provision of Jesus Christ on the cross. He paid an infinite price for you because you're worth it. This is the gospel, and this is the gift of salvation. What does the gospel mean to you this morning? Are there areas of your life that you've not yet surrendered to Christ? What are they? Is your trinity still me, myself, and I? Or is it Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Is it time you put, and I put, Jesus in the driver's seat? If an EMT pulled up to you and gave you a spiritual assessment, what type of patient would you be? Would you be clueless? You don't know anything about Jesus? Maybe you're not even looking for him. You're unaware of sin. Friend, if that is you this morning, don't leave here without pulling me aside or stopping and asking one of the ushers. There's prayer cards in, in the pew racks in front of you. Fill one out, put your name down and say, I need to talk to somebody, talk to somebody. So are you clueless? Are you combative? You know what you need to do. You know you're in sin, but you just can't seem to get out of it and you're fighting it tooth and nail. Again, call out to one of us. Maybe you're the cooperative calm one. 
grateful for what God has done and obedient to his word. If that is you, please reach out to somebody else who needs God's love and grace. We all need to take spiritual inventories of our lives that we would check our vital signs in diagnosing our walk with Christ. May God give us grace to respond to whatever the cost that we would be dead to ourselves and alive to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now we'll move into a time of communion if Troll would come forward. 